Okay, so today's roundtable uh, has, I'm delighted that three of our local uh, intellectuals have agreed to, to speak today. Um, our first speaker will be Andrew Singer, who you may remember from the semester, who gave a talk about reminding literature. Um, Andrew is the director of Traffic of Europe, which is both an online journal, literary journal, of contemporary emerging uh, literary voices throughout Europe, as well as the radio show Traffic of Europe that's connected to it. He also teaches here at Penn State. Um, our second speaker, uh, to my immediate right, is Anna Napraskaya, who is completing a PhD in French and French and Foreign Studies, um, studying, I'm going to say, she's <laughs> writing a dissertation about, uh, let's say, uh, immigrant uh, artistic groups in France. And finally, Michael Maidan, who's the Waskow family professor of Ukrainian studies and professor of German and Slavic studies at Penn State. Um, and then you know personally as well. So please give them a round of applause and uh, then we'll get started talking about the <laughs> first Okay, so Andrew, you want to get started? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, a flicker of amusement passed through my mind when you referred to me as an intellectual. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I do love talking about literature. And we're very privileged, we people who talk about literature, because um, sometimes uh, what we look at is very much an archival um, uh, process. You know, we're looking at uh, dead voices from hundreds of years ago, and uh, we have the great leisure that they are not going to uh, bother us with uh, contemporary issues and concerns. Um, but other times like this, there's a tremendous excitement of being absolutely, totally in the moment. And um, in this case, uh, as Jonathan alluded, we are very much in the moment with this topic. Right now, at this very moment, um, some uh, thousands of uh, miles uh, across the globe, this woman, Svetlana Alexievich, is receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature. She's giving her speech right now in Sweden, as we sit here. Um, probably she's just two-thirds of the way done, or something <laughs> like this <laughs> with her speech. Um, so yeah, her concerns and her achievement are extraordinarily relevant for our times, and I suggest for ourselves. And so it's a great um, privilege to be able to convene and to talk about it a, a bit. Um, perhaps unlike my colleagues here, I'm much more of a generalist, perhaps uh, a synthesis or something. So. Um, that's maybe why I'm uh, invited to go first, and I just want to make some general remarks about her form and her achievement and, uh, and her approach. Um, firstly, it's, it's notable that her Nobel Prize acceptance speech that she's giving right now is in Russian language, and her writing as well is in Russian language. She's from Belarus, actually originally, uh, uh, as you'll probably hear from Michael, born in Ukraine. Um, but grew up as a, as a Belarusian for, uh, with mixed parentage. Um, and yet, there is a culture in that part of the world, um, particularly remaining with Belarus and uh, in relation to Russia, which has very much occupied her attention and her life and her travails and her achievements. And she chooses to write in Russian in order to actively um, be a participant in that conversation and affect that culture. So there are, there are great cultural um, issues that swirl around these choices that she makes. But what's most extraordinary is the way in which she's expressing these ideas and these narratives. Uh, nothing that I'm about to share with you is original thinking to my own. You can find it uh, just as me if you dig uh, a bit. But I'm happy to prevent, present to you some of these thoughts. Um, the permanent secretary of the Swedish Academy, Sara Danius, um, when announcing that Svetlana Alexievich has won this year's Nobel Prize for Literature, said that she invented a new literary genre, which she calls, quote, a history of emotions, a history of the soul, if you wish. And what does it mean that she's invented a new genre? She's writing what is presumably nonfiction, and there have been, surprisingly perhaps, other Nobel Prize winners for literature who were writing nonfiction. Um, people quickly forget we have uh, Winston Churchill, who won a Nobel Prize for Literature, um, um, Bertrand Russell, uh, and, and there have been others, um, notably from Russia, um, uh, uh, um, 
<laughs> who wrote the uh, Gulag Archipelago? Solzhenitsyn, also writing nonfiction. Um, but <laughs> what differs in her case is that she's not she's not looking to write a narrative. She's not looking to make a grand synthesis. She's not trying to be the arbiter uh, and interpreter of world events. She's, she's doing quite the opposite. She's undermining those grand narratives by simply presenting a collection of voices. Um, she is allowing her subjects whom she has interviewed to speak in their own voice for themselves, full stop. She is not um, overtly putting a grand narrative around that to give these uh, the weight of history or the interpretation that she wants to give them. And that's already a very subversive um, and yet very exciting approach. Uh, I'll talk uh, in a moment about why it's so exciting. But her background is journalism. And so what distinguishes this process from journalism? In, in her own words, she says, quote, I'm a writer who happens to use some tools of journalism. And she, she was mentored as a journalist and worked as a journalist for many years. And uh, one of her great influences was a man who was a journalist and also a novelist, Alice uh, Adamovich. And he wrote a fictional book, which was essentially journalism, but he interspersed it with pages of interpretation and intellectualization and, 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 uh, and narrative and conclusion. And this is what she is fighting against in the <coughs> approach that she developed. Um, but at the same time, she's not keen on just collecting or writing fact. There, there, is a, there, there is a trend nowadays in journalism to be um, more literary. Uh, there's, there's a whole genre in, some, in that part of the world, um, reportage, which is popular in Poland and other countries. And in fact, there's a phrase for this kind of journalism more generally in Polish, um, li literatura faktu, the literature of fact. But that's not what she's doing. Um, her method is very artistic. It's very even painterly, we can say. Um, she has developed her own process for putting together her, no, her books, uh, which is as follows. She tapes conversations, and these are hundreds and hundreds of conversations. She has them transcribed. Then she writes out from the transcripts longhand, and as she's writing out longhand, she's rehearsing out loud. She says out loud back to herself these narratives, and she accumulates them in a certain ways until she gets somewhere between a hundred voices, based on somewhere around 500 uh, interview subjects. And then she's not done. She continues to refine it and hone it. Um, she comes back and re-interviews her subjects up to 20 times. Um, and she says in her own words, it's like painting a portrait. You keep going back and making calls, adding a stroke at a time. So there's an incredible artistic compositional method to what she's doing, which results in a work which is, these are, these are swords of, of memory and emotion, you know, her, her book. And that's not just accidental result of her collecting rapidly and throwing them together. It takes her up to a decade to write one of these books. And um, additionally, to distinguish her from other journalism, she's, she's, she's really crafting voices rather than portraits of people. She's not showing us the life of this particular family devastated by this particular incident. She's giving us the voice of the woman survivor who's just telling about it, with all of her foibles and her pauses and her awkwardness and her doubling back, and her surprising bouts of greatness in the statements that she makes. And therefore, the philosophy, the grand philosophies do come out, very explicitly so, but in a totally new way from traditional literature. So that's what makes it at once literary and new. Um, you know, when you have the voice of a Pushkin or a Dostoevsky or something, you know, the grand themes are stated to you. You know, they are explicit, they're overt, they're programmatic in the works. And that's the old um, mold of literature. I, I love it, I'm not criticizing it. But that's not at all what she's doing. And yet those grand ideas do anyway come through because they come through authentically through the voices of these um, 
people that she's interviewing. And they have an astonishing array of epiphanies and um, observations because they're the people that have suffered these particular conditions and uh, events and circumstances uh, often for decades on their own. And so they have synthesized and when we hear such an incredible uh, grandness of, of conclusion coming from such an ordinary, ordinary voice, um, it, it's something new. It, it wakes us up. It gives us a sense of immediacy and brings us right into the present that this is going on around us, it's going on now, and what an extraordinary um, reconstruction uh, back into the grand themes we have from that process. Might I just get, provide an illustration of what you just said? Or, or just For sure. Uh, so, you know, the risk of interrupting, I just think this would be really interesting. This is one of the passages I was really struck by early in the Voices from Chernobyl book. So it's, it's, in, a pass, it's in a section called Soldier, Soldier's Chorus, where there's a number of, of the soldiers who are stationed uh, at Chernobyl to, 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 to administer the site and to prevent people from coming in and out. And there's a really interesting snapshot um, of one of those grand narratives at, at work. So um, one soldier, and I'll just read a, a passage here. The village street, the field, the highway, all of it without any people. This is what the soldier's witnessing and remembering. A highway to nowhere, electrical wires on the posts to nowhere. At first there were still lights on in the houses, but then they turned those off. We'd be driving around and a wild boar would jump out of the school building at us, or else a rabbit. Everywhere are animals instead of people, in the houses, the schools, the clubs. There are still posters. Our goal is the happiness of all mankind. The world proletariat will triumph. The ideas of Lenin are immortal. These are all quotations. You go back to the past. The collective farm offices have red flags, red new wimples, neat piles of printed banners with profiles of the great leaders. On the walls, pictures of the leaders. On the desks, busts of the leaders. A war memorial. A village churchyard. Houses that were shut up in a hurry. Gray cement cow pens, tractor mechanics shops cemeteries and victims. As if a warring tribe left some base in a hurry and then got into hiding. We'd ask each other, is this what our life is like? It was the first time we saw it from the outside. The very first time. It made a real impression, like a smack to the head. It was a good joke. The nuclear half-life of a cake is 36 hours. So, and for me, it took me three years. Three years later, I turned in my party card, my little red book. I became free in the zone. Chernobyl blew my mind. Yeah. She is working with some of the great and important events and themes that we're living through in this age. And as she puts it, she's doing that in the service of moral memory. She's, um, she's carving out a space where it's the emotions that speak. She's not foregrounding the people as personalities. In fact, her, her um, narratives are anonymous. She doesn't allow to use their names uh, uh, because she, she is really focusing on the voice uh, and, and the emotions that arise from it and the extraordinary things that they're saying. Um, but having said that, uh, she differs from an artist as well. She, there, there is a strong journalistic streak in what she's doing. She's choosing her topics with exquisite care. Um, they include uh, the Soviet occupation uh, uh, of Afghanistan, um, the uh, Chernobyl disaster, uh, women in war, uh, which is an extraordinary topic, the, the fall of the Soviet Union and how people experienced that and navigated it. Um, and yet, her approach also differs, uh, as much as it differs from that of journalism, it differs from traditional art. And so I just want to finish by quoting her in talking about her own work um, it, uh, as follows. This is her talking. Today, when man and the world have become so multifaceted and diversified, the document in art is becoming increasingly interesting, while art as such often proves impotent. The document brings us closer to reality as it captures and preserves the originals. After 20 years of work with documentary material, having written five books on their basis, I declare that art has failed to understand many things about people. But I don't just record a dry history of events and facts. I'm writing a history of human feelings. What people thought, understood, and remembered during the event. What they believed in or mistrusted. What illusions, hopes, and fears they experienced. This is impossible to imagine or invent, at any rate in such multitude of real details. We quickly forget 
what we were like 10 or 20 or 50 years ago. Sometimes we're ashamed of our past and refuse to believe in what happened to us in actual fact. Art may lie, but document never does. So I'm very happy to thank the Nobel Committee for calling our attention to this wonderful and unique body of work which is still going on and, um, and also uh, pleased to see how it's distinguished from those and that we still have work to do in developing our forms and that uh, this wonderful uh, adventure of literature is not a, a moribund exercise by any means but is continuing far into the, far into the future. Thank you. do, um, well first of all I have to probably explain, since I'm officially, I belong to the French side, what am I doing here, but my accent you can hear that I'm Russian, so that probably <laughs> explains a little bit. Um, I will continue in the same direction, I'll probably add a few details to the same topics that uh, Andrew talked about, and I think mostly I will add more questions rather than give you answers, but maybe it's too early to have answers and she's still working. So um, having questions now maybe is more important and also because herself when she talks in more than one interview about her work, says that her work is asking questions. She doesn't give answers, she doesn't um, develop uh, a theory and understanding. She, she uh, tries to record an experience. And uh, in one of her interviews she says that when she was trying to find her own style, her own way of writing and she couldn't do that because she felt that the truth, the, the human experience is scattered throughout. There's no one experience, one like one story that could stand represent all. And the way she found her voice was actually after reading a book by Alice Damovich who you mentioned, um, uh, I'm from the Burning Village uh, in Russian Yezok and that's a collection of voices, collection of uh, recollections, um, mostly women's recollections from uh, Second World War in, um, in Belarusia and Belarusia. Um, and that would, would um, move her towards her own style. And in fact, there is one detail she does. Some people do give their names. So there, there are voices that don't have a name to attach to it, and there are voices that do have a name attached to it. Um, and that is why I, before today, I, I want to reread some articles by Alessi Damovich, uh, trying to figure out how he saw, because that's, he's probably not a teacher, but uh, probably the biggest influence on her style, uh, how he saw that method, that way of writing by not writing, but rather putting together uh, memories of other people expressed by uh, other individuals. And he saw it in two, in two steps. One uh, would demand what he thought was a great courage by a writer to overcome the urge to write, to, to, to the urge to express his or her own feeling or understanding of an event, and just step aside and allow an individual you're listening to speak the way they, they express themselves. And then after collecting those stories, the, the next step would be give it a form. Uh, reorganize it in something coherent. And if we look at the structure that she gives to those stories, they do have a very specific structure different from book to book, depending on the topic and, and depending on her own feeling for it. And feeling is an important word here because, for example, the, the book you mentioned, uh, well, in Russian it's called Chernobylskaya Malitva, so it's a, it's a prayer of Chernobyl, Chernobyl's prayer and in English translation it's Voices of Chernobyl, which is not exactly the same thing. Um, she tried to start working in it right away, and uh, the first two or three years she couldn't do that. So she couldn't feel it, that, that was, the thing her was not there, so she had to go back to it later. And why she came back to it, because she heard a specific story, a specific memory, she talked to uh, wife of one of the first, in Russian, well, we call them liquidators, the, the first people who were there. And 
they all died within 10 days, two weeks. They basically just decomposed because they were sent there the way they were, firefighters, and they literally walked over a melting reactor. Their, their legs were decomposing in the morning, they could not walk anymore. And um, this woman accompanied her husband to Moscow to this special hospital and <coughs> stayed with him. Um, she would not be normally allowed, but she lied, she said she didn't. She wasn't pregnant and later on she gave birth to a dead girl. Uh, but she stayed with her husband until very late and there was a moment when, when, when his guts were just going through his mouth and she would put something over, like a towel over her hand and it just would grab them out. And there is this horrifying, unhuman description of that. And when she, uh, Alexievich, when she heard that memory that was her push to go going back to that to, to, to Chernobyl and start recollecting. And it took her years doing it. There are more than 500 uh, stories altogether that she collected. But if we look at the structure of that book, it starts with this story, this probably most horrifying, most vivid memory. And this first shock that I've never heard her saying it explicitly, but I think that that's what it does. It kicks the reader out of the comfortable zone. You cannot go back to that zone anymore throughout the book. That, that moves you right out of the, this linear, comfortable existence of, uh, of events happening one after another. And for Chernobyl's book, that's the most important part because that's, that's what more important, most important for it probably, as she said. That's, we, we're accustomed to seeing death as immediate victims. Something happens, uh, a fight happens, bullets fly. That's what we custom from literature, from, from films, some of us from experience. And that's the death that it will come over generations and we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know, we're not accustomed biologically to understand what it is. That, that's her words in, in uh, one of the interviews. And so the structure of this book, the way that she organized those recollections, those memories, it uh, brings the same feeling. There is no end and, and no beginning. And again, that was her experience when she went to the what we call zone, when she went to uh, Chernobyl zone. And uh, that's what she felt, that there was no more time. There is no beginning and no end. The beginning and end, she says, word by word, she says, uh, beginning and end collided. And uh, the book, Chernobyl's um, Memories, they start with this horrifying story that immediately kicks you out. And then, from the comfortable, and it ends with a similar story of a wife of another liquidator. So the, the, it, it gives this circle, it gives this absence of the beginning and the end. And um, one of the questions that arises um, when, when one reads her, her books, including the, the last book that she wrote, uh, Time Second Hand, this question of time comes back again and again because uh, a, a, a catastrophe of a certain dimension, a catastrophe of such dimension breaks the time. The linear time no longer works. Uh, it's, it's no longer possible to create a story within this linear time. And that's one of the reasons why Adamovich, for example, would not uh, write fiction on certain topics like, like uh, a blockade in uh, Leningrad or the war. Um, her, her last book, uh, Time Second Hand, that's what she means by second hand, that the, what disappeared with the disappearance of Soviet Union was the disappearance of time. As one of the ladies whom uh, she interviewed, whom she spoke to an old, an old woman and says, well, socialism is no longer here, but we still are. And you have millions of people who, whose mind, whose experience all their lives belong to Soviet Union. That's where they live, and they cannot live anywhere else. But it's no longer here, so they belong nowhere. They're all of a sudden find themselves out of time, and that's why uh, after the 1990s, when the Soviet Union decomposed, um, there was a huge wave of suicides because the older generation, and not even just older generations, could not place themselves within this new existence, this new linear time, and that's what those recollections tell, among, besides uh, horrors of. 1930s, 1940s, 1920s. And another uh, 
No, that's, that's no, it's just a lot. That our experience, Soviet experience, and I, I can say our because I grew up in so still Soviet Union, that's experience of wars. We either lived wars or we prepared for wars. And when there was no more war, we didn't know what to do. Like our culture, our perception of the world, that could not be adjusted. She said that the whole huge continent the Soviet Union, as, as a cultural continent, went under the water and the millions of people are, stayed behind. One of the questions that's often asked, I heard from um, different audiences reading uh, her books, is it even literature? Because when, when you talk, Alexievich writes, she doesn't write. Right? She, that's not her text, that's not her word. So can you call literature something that is not written by the author, something that collected. And why I was thinking about it, I thought, well, is collage art? It also uses the pre-existed elements. And I sort of one specific example, also on a war topic, a conflict <coughs> topic. So if, if collage is art, then what she does, her novels are, can be considered as literature. But it's more of a question than an answer I, I can or cannot give. Uh, also, I, I thought that was an important because collage as, as an artistic technique, right, appeared after the First World War. So somehow a catastrophe of a huge dimensions produces this need for sp specific type of art that creates with pre-existed elements. And um, well, another question I, I wanted to uh, mention, probably, is the question of audience. Uh, because since, since her books are voices, right, and they're voices of people who talk about their own lives, their own experiences, there are many different types of audience, many different groups of people who perceive those voices in a very different manner. There are the audiences and there are more than one, obviously, who lived through the same period, uh, uh, of people who lived through former Soviet Union, and they perceive it in one way. People who remember the same events, they will see it one way. People who lived through the same events but uh, followed in a different direction or, could, or would only get their information, say, from official sources, like myself, I was in sixth grade when, when Chernobyl happened, would remember them entirely different way. So for me, reading this book was a revelation. Of course we knew there was a catastrophe. We had family in Ukraine, and my father is from Minsk. But we didn't have anybody directly there. So our information would come from official sources. So I remember it one way, th this book gives me an entirely different picture. Uh, it would be yet another audience of people who were born afterwards, for whom Soviet Union is just an abstraction. So the new generation will be yet another perception. It will be a different perception for somebody who, for whom um, all that experience is just exotic, something that happened far away in Russia, or Belarus, or Ukraine, and, uh, well, former Soviet Union. Translation obviously does not I almost said poetry, but I don't know if poetry can, something that can be applied to such a horrible, horrible memory. Uh, but it's, the, the meaning can be translated, but the words, the styles, the way, the, the vocabulary that those people use when they speak, it cannot be translated. So th those books and translations, even the titles, as I said, Voices from Chernobyl is not the same thing as Chernobyl's Prayer. In Russian, it's a Chernobyl prayer. I, I don't know actually why it was that the title was changed in the translation. It's yet another audience, and yet another perception, which is all very important. And all of them have the right to exist, but I think when we consider Alexievich's oeuvre, um, right, as, 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 as a whole, it's not only memory. And when, when she talks about Chernobyl, her Chernobyl's book, she said that she very often felt that she was not writing in memory, correcting and collecting in memory, she was writing about the future. All those perceptions taken together, again, 
throws out of this linear, linear time, which is probably one of her biggest achievements. And here I will stop. <laughs> And as, as Michael is, is taking over the speaking stick, I will steal it momentarily just to read you a passage that uh, uh, alluded to in the, this frame narrative by Yu Miller, talking about being in the hospital with her husband, the liquidator, and while she can liquidate. And one of the terrible ironies of this is that she, her presence in the radiation hospital in Moscow causes her to get stroke, have a stroke. Right, in, in her early 30s, and, and well, as, as well as to lose a baby. Um, the irony of that is that she steps out for a brief walk at the moment he dies. So right, she's both too present and not present enough. And uh, I'll just read you the, the, the passage about this you know, rather gruesome kind of moment, but it's important to hear whatever poetry is still in it <laughs> in translation. At the morgue, they said, want to see what we'll dress him in. I do. They dressed him up in formal wear with his service cap. They couldn't get shoes on him because his feet had swelled up. They had to cut up the formal wear too because they couldn't get it on him. There wasn't a whole body to put it on. It was all wounds. The last two days in the hospital, I lift his arm and meanwhile the bone is shaking, just sort of dangling. The body has gone away from it. Pieces of his lungs, of his liver, were coming out of his mouth. He was choking on his internal organs. I'd wrap my hand in a bandage and put it in his mouth. Take all of that stuff. It's impossible to talk about. It's impossible to write about, and even to live through. It was all mine, my love. They couldn't get a single pair of shoes to fit him. They buried him barefoot. Uh, I'll uh, obviously uh, kind of interweave what I have to say with uh, the excellent comments of my two predecessors here. Uh. Uh, one thing about uh, Alexievich, uh, I really had not heard about her until about five or six years ago. Uh, a friend of mine, a visiting Fulbright scholar, Maria Tetarenko, was working on her and uh, actually gave a lecture on her at a journalism conference that I attended, a uh, uh, new journalism conference that I attended uh, at Northwestern University with her. And uh, what was very interesting about that was that it really does, uh, she is a, a journalist and she does fit into the category of new journalism. So if you look at uh, new journalists such as uh, Tom Wolfe, uh, George Plimpton, uh, Truman Capote, Hutter Thompson, uh, but not so much an experiential new journalist, but uh, not, not somebody like a Plimpton who goes and plays professional football and then writes about it. Uh, she travels, uh, as you pointed out, to collect stories of other people, uh, to collect stories about people's humanity in, uh, under catastrophic conditions, uh, under awful conditions. And, uh, and that's really what her goal is, to show that humanity uh, uh, in her works. And they're really powerful, and I, I've actually listened to two audio books of hers, uh, one that's been translated as Zinky Boys, Tsenkovia uh, Malchiki, uh, which is about uh, collections of stories from Afghan war vets, uh, and then uh, the other one, uh, the Chernobyl Prayer, which is translated as Voices from Chernobyl, and uh, and also that initial initial interview that she does with uh, the woman who is married to the fireman, uh, and she travels to Moscow to the hospital is extraordinarily powerful. Uh, uh, I did want to point out one thing that. The, the book actually begins with uh, collections of facts. It gives you facts about Chernobyl, which are pretty hideous in and of themselves, uh, in terms of the percentage of arable uh, land that's gone, uh, the number over 400 villages disappeared in Belarus, uh, the, the levels of uh, contamination, uh, making the land inhabitable, uh, large uh, parts of it, and all of that is horrible, and then you get this personal story that comes right after these facts that are presented. And I just wanted to read one little quote uh, from the end of this, which uh, she really reveals her, uh, her method of what she's doing. And this, of course, dovetails with uh, what uh, others have said before me here. 
For three years, I rode around and asked people, the workers at the nuclear plant, the scientists, the former party bureaucrats, doctors, soldiers, helicopter pilots, miners, refugees, resettlers. They all had different fates and professions and temperaments, but Chernobyl was the main co content of their world. They were ordinary people answering the most important questions. I often thought that the simple fact, the mechanical fact, is no closer to the truth than a vague feeling, rumor, vision. Why repeat the facts? They cover up our feelings. The development of these feelings, the spilling of these feelings past the facts is what fascinates me. I try to find them, collect them, protect them. These people had already seen what for everyone else is still unknown. I felt like I was recording the future. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, Alexievich is not a political writer. She doesn't attack the Lukashenko regime or the Russian regime or the, the previous Soviet regime. She simply tells the stories. The stories themselves are more than an indictment of, of what government did, uh, what the Soviet government did, particularly in times during the Afghan war. That particular, uh, those particular stories, Zinke Boys, really uh, reminds me a lot of uh, uh, the reaction to Vietnam vets returning from Vietnam, you know, people who were reviled, people who, who just had, s you know, this was before people knew what post-traumatic stress syndrome was, and uh, all of these soldiers, and it, it's called, it's important that in that title that she calls them Malchiki, the boys. Malchik is a Russian word that means little boy. And these were uh, guys who were 18 or 19 years old uh, who were going off to war with very little preparation, uh, very, very poorly supplied. Uh, she talks uh, to, uh, I remember one of the striking uh, conversations she has uh, with one uh, former soldier is that they used to uh, feed them rotting meat uh, with, filled with worms, all kinds of bacteria. They would constantly be getting sick. They wouldn't have enough uh, ammunition for weapons. Uh, lived in squalor and uh, under awful conditions. And these very same soldiers, in order to survive uh, in, during the Afghan war, were selling ammunition to the enemy who was going to use that ammunition to kill them. Uh, they were given three rubles a day, uh, and they hardly had enough to, to eat and living in, in really squalid conditions, and they're selling their ammunition uh, to the enemy, basically, on the black market, to get themselves killed. And also, uh, not just to buy foodstuffs, but also to mostly buy drugs, uh, ma marijuana, opium, anything that would kill you know, the, the effect of uh, what they were experiencing during that. And uh, it's a really, uh, this is not stuff for the lighthearted to read. Uh, I also listened to the, I listened to the uh, Chernobyl book. I read the book in English, and then I listened to it as an audio book in Russian. Uh, and uh, whoever reads the, uh, that audio book in Russian, it's available on YouTube, for those of you who know Russian. Uh, really, <laughs> because it's in an oral form, and we have to remember that the, this, is, this is oral history. Uh, so I look at her as kind of an oral historian who is you know, selecting archiving uh, this history and giving you this emotional history of, of these events, uh, of these tragedies. And uh, hearing it as an oral history, you really hear the voices even more so than when you just read uh, out of the text. And uh, uh, although she wasn't critical of governments per se, she was exiled uh, from her native Belarus uh, for uh, 11 years from year 2000, was not uh, allowed to return uh, until uh, 2011. Uh, someone mentioned here that, uh, I think you mentioned that uh, even her Nobel speech is not being trans, this is the first Belarusian uh, Nobel Prize winner, half Ukrainian by the way, uh, uh, so first half Ukrainian uh, uh, Nobel Prize winner too. Uh, and it's not being translated directly because I'm sure that the Lukashenko uh, government is worried about what she might say. Uh, I doubt that she's going to say anything, you know, incredibly anti, you know, anti-Lukashenko government or political in nature, but uh, that's really not uh, her style and not what she does. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out that this, this is fairly rare to have someone writing nonfiction receive a Nobel like this, and Andrew pointed out a few of those. In the Russian tradition, Solzhenitsyn is... Uh, uh, really the one uh, who, who comes to mind, although people forget that Solzhenitsyn also wrote 
a lot of fiction works. Uh, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, uh, The First Circle, uh, The Cancer Ward were all works of fiction. Uh, And again, those works of fiction really showed uh, the humanity of people in the gulag, uh, of what experiencing uh, horrific conditions, but how they helped each other, how they showed their humanity under those conditions. Uh, when you see that first story that's in the uh, Chernobyl book, uh, it really it's, it slams into you like a truck. Uh, when you see what this uh, woman goes through just to be able to see her husband in the hospital, Everybody's saying, you're crazy. She hides the fact that she's pregnant because she knows if she tells them she's pregnant, they're not gonna let her go in there. Her husband is incredibly radioactive. The skin is falling out, as you pointed out. His organs are coming out uh, you know, through his digestive tract. Uh, and, uh, and she's you know, cleaning this up. Uh, and it's, just, it's, you know, it's presented just in a, I, I don't wanna say matter of fact way, but this is, this is just what happened. And uh, you know the the intensity of that is really uh, uh, mind-boggling in terms of uh, in terms of that. Uh, by choosing her for the Nobel, uh, I do think the Nobel Committee is making a statement. Uh, 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 and uh, there has been a tendency to move away from giving the Nobel purely for aesthetic reasons and shifting to give uh, give the prize to people for their contributions to humanity in general. And so I think this is a, a combination of the two. She's an incredibly talented uh, writer, but also presenting these events that, uh, and, and individual voices that people otherwise would not have heard is a really uh, a great contribution uh, you know, to world culture and understanding. Uh, and it really allows you to emphasize with all these people who uh, experience this uh, trauma uh, but she has the ability to personalize that trauma. It's not just, you know, okay, the soldiers are going through this, this is awful, uh, but you also have a tremendous amount of compassion for these uh, individuals as human beings uh, when you see what they go through. Uh, and one thing that I would apply to her works is something that uh, one of my previous mentors, Boris Filipov, used to say about uh, Solzhenitsyn. It's a concept called Kruglaya uh, Vinovnost, which is uh, kind of like a universal or shared guilt. She's not blaming, she's not saying, oh, uh, uh, Soviet government are bad boys or, or Lukashenko's a bad boy. Uh, she's not saying that. I mean, the, the material itself <laughs> tells you that and you can make your inferences uh, from that. But she's, she's really saying that, you know, this is what happened and we, all of society, uh, you know, are complicit in this. We allowed this to happen, you know, as a, a community, as a nation, you know, as a people. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, uh, really, uh, you know, the essence of what she's doing. And I think I'll stop there to leave time for questions or comments if people have those. So. Okay, well, first of all, thank our presenters. <laughs> and before opening things up to, to questions, I want to make sure that I don't monopolize this. I just wanted to make an interesting move that well, those of you who were here last week can, can, can see. If last week's uh, talk by David Cunningham talked about the world historical novel and uh, how that becomes almost by the necessary derivation of the logic of a certain kind of historical project becomes a novel of, of capitalism, right? This is sort of the, the, the project that, that we saw outlined last week. And I can see uh, here, we've heard here how uh, one of the answers to that is to change <laughs> the novel, right? <laughs> to really change the, the, the kind of form so that we're not just getting a history of how there's no possibility of any kind of class or any kind of understanding, right, through historical fiction, but rather changing the nature of fiction itself allows the necessary openness that, that we get here. Um, I just thought it was a striking, a striking uh, ex- example. Um, so not so much a question, but maybe a, a, a Invitation for other questions. George? A couple of things. That, um, this woman's husband had been in the hospital in Chicago. Was he conscious when he was? Yes. The other thing is you suggested that there's no addressing the master, master narrative, but one tends to emerge from these recordings. Could, could you suggest what sort of master narrative emerged? 
Well, if you're talking specifically about this book about Chernobyl, the, the, um, there is an artistic cohesion to it, which she is very conscious of crafting. And it's in the flow of the voices and the layering of experience uh, and, and, and the order of unfolding in which we experience it. So it very much works on us in uh, a traditionally artistic mode, as far as that goes. Um, and in that context, there's a kind of deconstruction of master narrative because it's the or so-called ordinary people themselves who are concluding these um, grand uh, narrative type uh, thoughts about love and death and the, 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 the uh, incredible uh, value and, and endurance of humanity and so on and so forth, which traditionally the novelist inserts or, um, or uses as, a, as a, an explicit um, constructive device in, in patterning a novel. This subverts that and allows us to conclude it from these disparate voices. And in a surprisingly um, non-trivial number of cases, for the voices themselves to come up with these conclusions based on their experience. And so it, it reaffirms the authenticity of it. It reinvigorates the concepts and gives them an immediacy for us, which perhaps a traditional novel um, risks losing in a contemporary context. I'd like to just add to that that critics have called it polyphony, polyphonic. It's a polyphony of voices that uh, merge together to create a chorus. So, I mean, that's how they describe it in part. I wanted to add that uh, Adamovich called that type of writing or collecting the stories an epic chorus. Well, he, he gave throughout uh, his interviews, he gave different, different names, but epic chorus was one of them, a collective novel. He also noted that uh, in one of his articles, I believe, you know that we we hate the war, but we some we eventually become start loving our memory of the war, and that's what fiction does. That's why the refusal of of writing fiction on certain topics. And um, I think Alexievich said that about her last book, uh, Time Second Hand, that this disappeared continent, the people who lived on it are are, are still around, but. Um, the, to, to keep their experience, to remember their experience, their only way is to listen to them. Because writing a fiction about it will uh, displace it, right? Will take, will take eventually, will take its place. So our memory, our written fictional memory of an event will eventually replace the real memory of that event, even in the mind of those who lived through it. So that's one of the reasons why she does what she does, because she tries to it's still, well, it's arguable, obviously, because it's still recollections still put in words, still collected by her. So it's, it's still not direct, it cannot be direct, it still goes through verbal expression, but it's probably as direct as we can possibly approach it. Two examples. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, <coughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, acquaintance with this author. Um, so in Alfred Nobel's will, he uh, said that the Nobel Prize should be given to writing that is in an idealistic direction, which is a rough translation of the Swedish. And for uh, several decades, in fact, that was the main concern of the committee, much more than what genre of writing uh, uh, they were dealing with. The very first winner of the Nobel Prize, in fact, was a historian, uh, Mommsen by name. Um, my question is this. Um, uh, so maybe we're returning to that. Uh, you know, Alfred Nobel's original intentions. But my question is this, um, history of emotions. I'm wondering what, is, what, what are the markers of emotion uh, in, in these texts? Because even, say, in that horrific passage that Jonathan read, the one that everyone mentioned, you know, uh, I mean, there's the word love in there. Um, clearly the idea of the shoes and not having shoes is important, but, but what is the emotion? Is it shame? Is it anger? Is it disgust? Is it uh, pity? Um, and so, you know, just very, you know, I just wonder how does she, and, and back to the no, traditional notion of literature, which is that it's some, something transactional, right? And a lot of a lot of literary texts uh, can be endowed with emotion by the reader, right? It's up to the reader to decide exactly what the emotions are that are going on in a particular text. I'm just wondering how 
you know, does she put in little markers or, you know, uh, use italics or, you know. Could I read a passage before you answer? Because I think you'll, you'll, you'll say wonderful things. I just want to read a passage where a lot of, there are markers, right? There are pauses and so forth, but part of it seems to be exemplarity is, is, the, is, the, is, is the way that the, historiogra the historiography of emotions works. And I want to give a, another example because it's poignant, but it also suggests some of the ways in which suspension becomes one of the mechanisms of that recording. This is another one of the soldiers uh, whose first thing was he volunteered, there's an opportunism, he gets to be a hero. Um, we came home. I took off all the clothes that I'd worn there in the zone and threw them down the trash chute. I gave my cap to my little son. He really wanted it, and he wore it all the time. Two years later, they gave him a diagnosis, a tumor in his brain. There's three mislipses. You can write the rest of this yourself. I don't want to talk anymore. Well, there is also the fact that, well, the, all those emotions you mentioned, they're all of them. And of course, it, it depends on the reader, because there are many different readers, many different groups, and many, as many readers as many individuals. And uh, one and the same passage will obviously create a different response from a different person. But I think why we can say that writing, it is writing of emotions or collections of emotions, because that the moment when these people were not asked for facts, they were not asked for explanations, they were not given specific, what did you do question, right? The question would be, and they're not given, so we know exactly how she, what questions she asked, or if she just let them speak. Most likely the, 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 the second probably. Um, but most of them, or at least those that she chosen to keep in the box, they speak about what they felt. They say where they were, what was happening at the time, but it's secondary. They're, they're not trying to preserve the, the story, the factual story. They're, they're trying to tell what they felt at the given moment or uh, what they're feeling were at the time and then later on when they look back to it and they try to comprehend what happened. So maybe in this respect as well, because it's not, of course, factual part is here, but it's not factual. It's more emotional, more feeling level than factual. Uh, I would add one thing to that too in terms of and I've actually studied this a little bit myself. I started an art, writing an article, but I've, I haven't finished it yet. But uh, literature that deals with tragedies, that, and tragedies that are so massive that they're incomprehensible to human beings. I mean, the, the Holocaust, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, 9-11. You can't deal with tragedies on that, that massive of a level and, and uh, you know, have an emotional reaction because it's so shocking, it's, it just destroys you. And, and the way to powerfully deal with those tragedies is operate on an individual level. Uh, uh, there's a famous, uh, well this is a supposedly Stalin who said that, said this, uh, the death of uh, one man is a tragedy, the death of millions is, is a statistic. Uh, and that's been attributed to Stalin. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not. Adrian might know better since it, uh, I but quoted it in my quotes and say it's apocryphal, probably about that. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but I think that in, in many respects that's true, and it's what these individual voices and what they experience, and all those that gamut of emotions, and uh, this this uh, poor woman who ran up against a very bad Soviet bureaucracy to begin with in, in terms of trying to see her husband. Also, the, the inhumanity she uh, uh, runs into by the way she's treated by these people who don't understand her suffering, uh, who won't allow it. So you, you really empathize you know, with the individual characters in a way that you can't empathize with just the massive notion of you know, the facts of these, all these awful things that happen. Because you can't comprehend it at that level. But on an individual level, you can comprehend it in terms of emotion. Anger also is an important emotion that appears in the reader, at least. N not that much, in, 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 surprisingly, not, not in those who speak, but in the reader. There was one, I, I remember when in the Chernobyl's book, specifically, there, there are people who recall that nobody knew what, what it was, and apparently it was beautiful, the burning reactor. People would come to see. 
right? There's an around from it they came to see, and they were they would bring kids up on, on the balconies to look at that. And there was uh, one story when um, there were several friends together, and one of whom was a doctor, and she tried to tell her friends, like, run, grab your kids and run, and they were very angry with her. Like, they, they meaning authority, they would have told us. And th they're not, th the person who's recalling all that, she's not angry, she's rather sad. She said in a very emotionally stable way, but in the reader, like, this anger is here, like, how could you? But it is it's so easy now, looking back. And so th there are a lot of different kinds of emotions. And, and uh, when we say there is sadness, there is suffering, there is this, but, but we rarely mention anger, but it's clearly there as well. And this notion of uh, emotions, I believe, uh, is couched in the larger achievement of authenticity, that they are in service to create re-establishing authenticity in the literary voice. I believe it was Adorno who said, um, possibly in the early 70s, and I'm sure I'm angling it terribly, but in essence what I remember of it is that as soon as someone is able to make a popular Hollywood film about the Holocaust, then we're done. You know, culture, the last nail of the coffin in, in, in blurring the line between um, um, authentic, authenticity and this nebulous idea of what, what we have in pop culture is, is breached. And that happened with uh, Schindler's List. And so the, the contribution that uh, an approach like this gives is in reestablishing uh, a sense of immediacy and authenticity for what, as Michael says, events that are so over the top that we don't have a framework for processing them. And an argument is made somewhere that these events in Chernobyl are even more horrific and more important uh, for us to get our heads around, even than the Holocaust. Because in the Holocaust, all those people were killed Whereas in the case of Chernobyl, they lived on for decades and had to suffer that incredible torture um, without a framework for dealing with it, without a, a public or state framework for dealing with it. But by the same token, therefore, people didn't have a narrative for dealing with it. And therefore, when she approached them, their voices were still raw, their memories were still authentic, and she was able to capture that level of it, that aspect of it. And that's what communicates most clearly in the book. And it really gives you a startlingly uh, immediate and immediately authentic sense of, of what's happened. And on that very ground, I think one of the interesting figures to, to place alongside Alexievich is the Steps Turkle, uh, methodologically speaking, right? So the difference is where the Turkle would, would, would collect these uh, oral histories about work, right, about race. Uh, these are topical, right? I mean, and they are sort of these inchoate, sort of somehow. <laughs> inhuman in the sense of insoluble ideas in, in the United States, but the idea of, of what comes to stand for authenticity, right, is actually the, the divergence along the scale of emotions and investments, right? One, one of the striking things about, about the Chernobyl book is that it includes uh, testimonies of resettlers who've gone back, right? Some people coming from uh, out of the Afghanistan war, um, refugees, and some people just you know want to go back to their village, and they're in various states of <laughs> health on results of, uh, on, on account of that, right? One of the people that's, who's tasked with one of the group people tasked with um, exterminating all the pets in the area uh, likes it, right? But most of them don't. Most of them are rather horrified by this by this task. Um, but one of them, one of the voices in there, really enjoys that, right? And the fact that that's part of the story. Right, and not somehow an inhuman anathema to it. Um, that, that, that variation, I think, is also important uh, for providing right, what would otherwise have to become a narrative that would close down on, on those investments, whether for ethical reasons or simply for, for, for artistic ones. Right, it's not closed down. And she does have markers, uh, yes, in answer to your uh, other part of your question. So there's a, a great deal of um, techniques that she's evolved for allowing these voices to remain in their in, in their authentic uh, uh, mode. She includes, you know, the word silence in brackets, long silence. Um, the characters double back and um, come back to an emotionally difficult topic a, a couple pages later and add a little more detail. It's very much the way you would imagine a person talking is. And she has, a, he, she has arted, she's achieved this 
through the technique of going back sometimes and re-interviewing them multiple times, even more than a dozen times, and as she says, painting it uh, one stroke at a time like a portrait. So she's very conscious of that. And you can see also across the development of her, of her genre that she's moving more into the emotional terrain as she develops as a writer. So she's started out earlier a little more factually oriented, and she has caught, you know, she herself has seen what's worked and caught this, this essence of it and deepened in the emotional terrain in the later books as well. So she's consciously developing this uh, as an idiom. There are titles to stories, it's not in all books, but in the last one and the one preceding it about the people who tried to commit suicide after the 1990s, addicted by death. The, the one, the shorter book that some of those stories entered into the last one, the Time Second Hand, they have titles and some titles change from one book to another, so her own perception of the, that specific memory must have changed. When, when I mentioned those negatives, the one who liked killing pets, or in, in her last book, uh, a recollection of somebody who was in the killing squad and considered it work, a job, uh, those stories are rare. They are pure rarely. They are there, but they they are pure rarely. Maybe only as a reminder of this, like, the darker side. But they're, most of them are of a different kind. Right? So the, it's not what I'm trying to say. It's not 50-50, right? right? It's they are there they're for a different time. reason, right? Right? right. I also want to add that it's it's a tribute to her uh, personality to be able to get this out. Of that's, you can't. Uh, you have to understand that everybody she's interviewing, these are closed societies where you are not allowed to freely express yourself, where you get in deep trouble for freely expressing yourself. But she's able to get people to be uh, open and authentic with her in, in ways that would be very difficult. Uh, so that's an amazing gift and ability that she, she has, and it's a really tribute to her you know, personality to be able to do that. Great. As I am sure that Aksevich has actually now finished her own <laughs> speech, um, I think we have to run out over time ourselves. So please join me in thanking our panelists today.